What is the unprecedented message sent to Iran and is the IDF's entry into Rafah imminent? We'll take a look at the plan and the growing concern that only 40 of the 133 Israeli abductees held by Hamas are still alive. I'm Yair Pinto and this is your boots on the ground report about what is happening in Israel on the 199th day of Israel's war against Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and Iran. In the past 24 hours, amidst the questions surrounding the likely entry of the IDF into Rafah in the Gaza Strip, Egyptian diplomats, parliamentarians, and military personnel discussed alternative facing Cairo. The head of the Egyptian Council for Foreign Affairs and former Egyptian Foreign Minister Ambassador Muhammad El Arabi told the Egyptian newspaper El Shirek El Ausat that Israel has a strong intention to carry out a military operation in Rafah. It will be soon. Another Egyptian source told the pro-Qatari El Arabi El Jadid newspaper yesterday that the American administration approved the plan for Israeli action in Rafah in return for Israel not attacking Iran extensively. Officials in the Biden administration denied the statements and claimed Israel and the United States never discussed giving the green light to Rafah action in exchange for the limited Israeli action against Iran. Meanwhile, legal documents posted by the government indicate that Israel has plans to bring 10,000 tents to the areas outside Rafah in the next two weeks, apparently meant to temporarily house the civilian population as it moves out of the city. According to the same documents, 30,000 more tents are currently in the process of being purchased and will be introduced to the area later. The IDF also has plans to drop leaflets on the city this week, urging civilians to evacuate the area. It is important to take note that out of the 1.3 million Gazans who had crowded into Rafah at the height of the fighting, an estimated 250,000 of them have left the city and moved to areas further north since the IDF's partial withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, mainly settling down in the area between Nusirat and Khan Yunis, south of Wadi Gaza Line. Aside from the press statements, official leaks to the press, speculations and gossip, we can try and estimate how and when the move into Rafah will start. There will need to be two phases to the operation in the southernmost city of the Gaza Strip. In the first stage, the IDF will begin issuing formal proclamations calling for the evacuation of the population, something that has not yet happened. The setting up of tents and other infrastructure, so these people will have some place to go, will also need to happen before an operation can proceed. Some, but not all, of the evacuated civilians will move to Khan Yunis, and some to the coastline. Only when as many civilians as possible have been moved out of the city will the green light be given for the IDF to move in and finish off the remaining Hamas formations. This will probably last two to three weeks and is expected to bring more waves of evacuated civilians. This operation will only take place in coordination with the US and Egypt, both of which have a strong desire to reduce as much as possible damage to the population. To this end, the planning and coordination for a move into Rafah has been ongoing for the past several weeks. But this morning, there was a report in the Qatari news portal that Egyptian army units in the northern Sinai are on high alert. This is a possible sign that they are preparing to manage the entry of Palestinians from Rafah into their territory as a result of an Israeli operation. On the other hand, it might just be a training exercise so they'll be ready to respond when the time comes. In any case, it's an indication that things are moving forward. Please continue to help us spread the truth by sharing our videos on social media, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and sharing us with anyone who wants to know what really is happening in Israel and in the Middle East. This is how you can help us spread the truth. Now, I want to switch the focus to the war against Iran and analyze some of the events of the last few days. To start with, the Israeli strike on the airbus in Isfahan proved a point to the Ayatollah regime that it could penetrate their airspace without fear of the air defense systems at any time. 
Iranian officials often boast about the effectiveness of their air defense system. And now the whole world knows that they are exaggerating. This is a major failure of their deterrence and their overall geostrategic posture. On the other hand, the Iranian attack on Israel, which saw 60 tons of explosives loaded on over 300 weapons that were fired on us and resulted in only one injury to a civilian child and cosmetic damage to an IDF base, was a massive humiliation for Iran's offensive missile program. The regime has spent an enormous amount of money and invested all its prestige in this program, but the missiles turned out to be no match for Israel's own defensive systems. So both sides launched an attack to do some damage to the other side and to prove a point about how much more damage they could do if they wanted to. Israel accomplished their objectives while Iran utterly failed to accomplish theirs. I also believe that the timing of these events is important as the attack on Iran occurred on Khamenei's 85th birthday and while Iran is celebrating Iranian Army Day, this is a clear message from Israel. If you are interested in escalation, we are ready for it. But to fully understand what Israel did, you need to understand how Iran stores its weapon stockpiles and the different parts of its nuclear program. The military bases and storage facilities are scattered throughout the country, buried deep underground and fortified with air defense systems. Therefore, the experts warn that it will be difficult to destroy the stockpiles with airstrikes. But first, let's take a look at where Iran gets its weapons from. The international sanctions imposed on Iran have cut it off from the supply of advanced weapons and equipment for the production of weapons such as tanks and fighter jets. Even earlier, during the war with Iraq, which raged between 1980 until 1988, Few countries agreed to sell weapons to Iran. Following that war, when Ayatollah Khomeini became the supreme leader of Iran, he ordered the establishment of a local arms industry and poured resources into these efforts. He wanted to ensure that Iran would no longer be forced to rely on foreign countries for defensive needs. The Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps was put in charge of the production of ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and UAVs and this is where most of the money was invested. This program has made great progress in the last 15 years, aided by technicians and scientists from North Korea and Russia. Experts estimate that Iran has produced large numbers of advanced missiles and UAVs, having given top priority to manufacturing these products. However, Iran's conventional armed forces, including the Navy, Air Force, Armored Corps, Engineering, and artillery have all been neglected and today most of the ships, planes, vehicles, weapons and equipment they have are obsolete and reported to be in very poor condition. An exception to this is the midget submarines the Iranian Navy received from North Korea over the past decade. Be that as it may, according to the Emirates Policy Center think tank in Abu Dhabi last year, Iran intended to spend 41% of its military budget on the development and production of weapons. So how do other countries assess the Iranian military and what are its weaknesses? Some assessments give the Iranian military high marks despite the assessment of its poor stocks of equipment. This can be partially explained by its relatively large size in numbers, with nearly half a million men in uniform in the regular military and another 200,000 in the IRGC, Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. The greatest weaknesses it has is its Air Force, which lists less than 300 fixed-wing aircraft and a handful of helicopters, most of which were built decades ago and are barely operable. Some of them are so old that spare parts are almost impossible to find. Nevertheless, Iran does have a capable electronic warfare capability, including two intelligence ships that it placed in the Red Sea to assist the Houthis in identifying Israeli-owned ships that they could attack, according to senior US officials. Please take an active part, support our work, and donate through this link below, so that together we can spread the truth 
and create additional videos for you. Switching focus again to Israel's relationship with the United States. The US House of Representatives voted last night to approve another aid package for Israel amounting to $26 billion, including more than $14 billion for military aid. This was part of a large spending bill, which also included military assistance to Ukraine and Taiwan. The bill is expected to pass in the Senate and be signed into law by President Biden very soon. Sadly, I must conclude this report by telling you that there is an increasing concern that only 40 of the 133 abductees held by Hamas are still alive. This figure was reported on Sunday morning in the British Daily Mail news portal, quoting an Israeli government source who said he was basing this estimate on information provided by the Shin Bet Israeli intelligence organization. However, the Shin Bet denied that this information came from them. In any case, the War Cabinet will convene tonight for the first time in 12 days for a discussion centered on the impasse in negotiations for a hostage deal with Hamas. The terrorist organization, which has been utterly defeated by the IDF on the battlefield, is now demanding a six-week truce in exchange for the release of less than 20 hostages, according to the answer it gave to mediators exactly a week ago, at the same time as the start of the Iranian attack. Please continue to pray for Israel, share and follow us on social media and subscribe to this YouTube channel. The most important thing all of us can do is unite in prayer for the peace of Jerusalem and for the Israeli hostages that are still kept somewhere in the Gaza Strip. So let's pray for the well-being both mentally and physically. And together we will win against this terrible evil called Hamas right here in Israel before it spreads to the rest of the world. Hello, this is Mati here in Jerusalem with TBN Israel. This is Yair Pinto from TBN Israel here in Jerusalem. TBN Israel is keeping viewers informed with Israel-focused news, culture, and what God is doing in this land. Support TBN Israel today online at tbn.org Israel. Thank you.